Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. These scriptures are as relevant today as they were then. We've had some uh, nepotism with the scripture reading here lately, haven't we? But I always say, if you're under like the age of, I don't know, like 12, you automatically qualify to read the scripture. So if you ever want to get your kids up here to read it, by all means, let's go, let's do it. So, hey, uh, my name is Dallas. If I haven't met you, I really would love the opportunity to meet you after service. I say that all the time, but trust me, I really would. Just come up, introduce yourself to me. I'd love to talk to you, get to know your story just a little bit better. Let me tell you where we're at. We are in our One Church Under God series, and we've talked about unity with Christ because you can't really have unity anywhere else unless you have unity with Christ first. And then we also talked about unity within our personal relationships. And then last week we talked about unity within the church, and we specifically talked about addressing conflict, right? Because conflict resolution is not something that comes easy to us. It's not natural. It's not something that we're necessarily equipped with tools in. And yet, it's also undoubtedly one of those things that we will face, and we will face over and over in our lives. So we talked last week about posturing our hearts towards being ready to handle conflict. And really, the first thing we talked about was that conflict is that area that we often will revert back to what's familiar. And in times of tension, in times of conflict, we will often just go ahead and revert revert back. So the Israelites... When they were freed from captivity, 400 years of slavery, just a few weeks later, there's some tension, there's some conflict, and they long to go back because that's what we do as humanity. So we talked about some ways that we revert back when there's conflict, and then we talked about how can we set our hearts up in a heart posture so that now we're, re- we're ready to respond to conflict the way that God desires for us. So number one, just to review, number one, remember who God is. That the first thing we got to do is get into stillness, get into quiet, get into a quiet space so that we can hear from God in the matter. And the second one was, remember who you are. So when we recognize our own need for grace, then our standard for that other person we're in conflict with isn't so high anymore, is it? And then we talked about, remember who the enemy is. We've got one enemy, and it's not that person that we're in conflict with, it's the enemy. So we can direct all of our need for division, all of our need for opposition onto the enemy, not that person that we're in conflict with. And then the fourth one was, remember who he or she is. Remember that that person in the church that you have conflict with is a child of God dearly loved. And it's not enough for us to simply love God. We also have to love his children, don't we? I mean, the best way you could love me is to love my kids, and the same is true with God. The best way we can love God is to love his kids. Now, Sometimes I fly by the seat of my pants, and that's good sometimes and not so good sometimes. But Friday, I thought going into Friday, we were going to close the series today. However, once I got to the fifth point, I figured we got to stay here basically the whole time. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ruin our Wednesday series because we're going to close this series on Wednesday. So Jesus in the Old Testament is getting pushed back a week, and we're going to finish... One Church Under God on Wednesday, and we're going to spend most of our time on point number five. Because if you don't have point number five, then you can really forget ever solving any kind of conflict. If you don't have point number five, you're going to take into every conflict baggage into the next conflict. So point number five is let go of the past pain and let it die. Now, Elsa had it part right. She said let it go. You also got to let it die. Man, Filter didn't catch that one in time. Hopefully, next time I'll catch it, filter those out. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, we'll let things go, but we never let it go long enough to let it die. Holding on to the past is one of the things that I think is really ruining this generation. Because undoubtedly, in your life, you're going to experience pain. That's just part of life. And some experience more pain than others, but all of us are going to have some level of pain. And the question really is, what do we do with that pain? And oftentimes in our culture today, we hold on 
to that pain, and we bring that pain into every conflict that we have. And what that'll do is it'll consume our minds. It'll bring so much baggage and so much heaviness into that current conflict because we never let go of past conflicts and let those things die. Having been in counseling for 12 years, I can tell you that the Christian way truly is the best way in terms of dealing with our past. See, in the Christian faith, it is ultimately about letting things go and letting them die because that is where genuine life ultimately will be found, by letting things die. Jesus goes to the cross, not so that we don't have to go to the cross, but so that we can follow his example of going to the cross. So we go to the cross, and, and that's how we ditch our little kingdom for his big kingdom. And yet that theme is also true throughout our lives, that there are things from our old life that we want to continually let go of and let die so that he can raise new life from that. John 12, 24, he says this, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, it is through letting things go and letting them die that new life can be found. Perhaps if we let go and let die of past conflicts, now we're best positioned to have life and flourishing in our current relationships and even in our current conflict. But you know, sometimes we will let things go and we'll say we've let it go, but really we continue to pick it back up, don't we? Think about if you've ever planted a garden. If you plant a seed, you cover it up, But then that next day, you go back to it, you take it out of the ground again, you're never going to see life from it, are you? And that's the point here. It reminds me of those memes that are going around where it's like, hey, God, I'm just kind of checking in on that thing that I gave you, you know. I'm just kind of going back to it and thinking about it. We may have let it go, but we can never let it die if we keep picking it back up. And that's the point here. How often do we think we've truly let something go, but then something triggers us to think back to that something with bitterness. It's because we may have let it go, but we didn't let it die. We pick it back up. So instead, it leads to our detriment and the detriment of our relationships because we never did let that thing die. And now we walk around wounded. We open ourselves up to not being able to solve conflict because we're bringing that previous baggage in that we never did let die. It reminds me of the story of the the dog who was hit by a car, and its hind legs was was hurt pretty badly. So it started dragging those hind legs around. And one day, this dog, she goes and she has puppies. And when those puppies are starting to move around, they look at their mama on how do you move around. And so they started dragging their feet around. Because they thought that's just how you live life. And while she had no choice in the matter, because of that physical ailment, we do have a choice when it comes to our past hurt. That we can take that into everything and the people around us will see that and see this is how you deal with conflict. You know, you just, you get angry, you get triggered, you get all these things, right? If we don't deal with the past and let those things go and let those things die, then inevitably that's going to carry on to everybody around us. For some of us, it could have been maybe a parent treated us poorly as kids or wasn't there. And every time we think about that, we just get so triggered. Or maybe it was a teacher. Maybe a teacher said something unkind to us all the way back in kindergarten. And we replay it and we get triggered by it. Or maybe it's an old friend. Maybe it's an old church member. And we've just over and over, we've just picked it back up. Every time we think about that person, you know, it it induces some angry feelings, some frustrating feelings, because we never did just let it go and move on. I think for us to handle a current conflict, we first got to let go and let die previous conflict. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, as Charlie did such a great job reading for us, says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, 
How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now Peter thinks he's being a good boy here because he's going beyond. He's going beyond the previous recommendation or expectation. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Jesus is saying, Peter, what you're focusing on here, you're focusing on what you have to do, but I'm trying to explain to you what you get to do. You get to ultimately live in freedom and not consider those things so much anymore. You're not the arbiter anymore of, of justice and mercy and all those things. You can actually just let those things die and live into the freedom that he's offering to us. He says 77 times. He's saying, he's saying just don't, stop counting. doesn't matter anymore. Just let those things die. And in doing so, you'll see life. You'll see flourishing in the relationships around you. I used to have a job where I would do counseling, and it was like an intensive counseling. Uh, typically, judges in the area would assign uh, my counseling service as like a last-ditch effort before the kid had to go in custody. So the kid's in trouble, you know, with the law and things like that, and they would assign my service to say, hey, if this doesn't work out, you go into custody. Well, no pressure, right? You know, But uh, I had this kid who was 15, and this boy, he was tough, big, burly kid, lived with his grandparents, and his grandparents really did nothing ever except for try to love him and take care of him and show him he was very loved. But he had all kinds of conflict with them. And principals, he got kicked out of public school, got kicked out of alternative school, was in a whole new like drug school uh, intensive program and was about to get kicked out of that one. Relationships with his peers weren't very good. And so I did the, you know, the initial things of, hey, be kind to your grandparents, you know, make sure you're doing the right things, get it on track, all that kind of stuff. But you guys know me by now. Sometimes I ask questions that border on like inappropriateness just to try to get to the heart of the matter. And I think there's actually biblical precedent for that, really. I mean, how often does Jesus ask a question even in response to a question? Why? Because he wants to get to the heart of the matter. You know, he doesn't really want to settle for just behavior modification. He wants life transformation. And you got to get to the heart of the matter in order to do that. So this kid was telling me a little bit about his story one day. And he never met his dad. And his mom lived right down the street from him. Has another kid, much younger, does live with his mom. But the mom wants nothing to do with him. So finally, I just asked him the question, do you think a lot of your conflict really has to do with the fact that your mom lives just down the street and doesn't want you? He starts bawling, crying. I mean, this big, burly, tough kid just starts bawling, sobbing, can't even respond for a few minutes. And finally, when he does work the courage to respond, he says, it's exactly right. It's exactly right. So I sat there with him. I prayed with him. Told him, hey, it's a shame that this is the way that things are. This isn't your fault that this happened to you. And at the exact same time, in order for any of your relationships to ever move forward, you're going to have to forgive your mom. You're going to have to let it go and let it die. It doesn't mean that she was getting off the hook. It doesn't mean that it was okay what she had done. It simply means that he's going to release her of the debt that she owes him so that he now can let it die and walk in freedom. And by the way, that's exactly what he did. Forgave his mom, and then he completed the program successfully. Praise God for that. It looked like he was going to go straight into custody. Began to change how he talked to his grandparents, and began to be ready for the next conflict when it came about because he wasn't carrying that previous pain into the next conflicts. And that's the point. We have got to let those things go that have happened to us and let those things die so that we don't bring those into the next conflict. 
question is, do you have past pain or bitterness that you keep carrying with you? And perhaps you've carried that hurt into conflict after conflict after conflict. If so, remember that word Manasseh from the book of Genesis. That is the name of Joseph's first child in the book of Genesis. It means to forget. Genesis 41, 51 says, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. God helped Joseph let go and let die to the point where he forgot about what his brothers had done to him. And look, I don't know how you come in this morning. I'm sure many of us have lots of pain in this room. But if I can be so bold as to say it most likely isn't to the degree that Joseph dealt with. I mean, his brothers beat him, leave him for dead, throw him in a pit, but then ultimately decide it'd probably be better for us to make some money off of him, so let's just sell him into slavery. So then he has to go to an entire foreign country away from his father, quite possibly the only one who really loves him, and quite possibly the only one he really loves. And he has to start completely over. And he says, God has allowed me to forget I mean, I let that thing die, and now he's allowed me to forget all about that pain. And by the way, this is before there was ever any reconciliation with his brothers. This is before his brothers ever admitted and said, I'm sorry, and said, I shouldn't have done that. He had just forgotten about it. Are there things today that we need to let die so that God can help us forget? If you want to see life all around you. If you want to see God bring life all around you, start with letting the past fall to the ground. Let that thing go. Let it die. And watch as he begins to change some things. Now, Joseph's firstborn son was named Manasseh. His secondborn son was named Ephraim, which means fruitful in the land of suffering. Verse 52, the second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So first, he forgives and forgets, and then there is fruit to follow. You see that? He forgives, he lets it go, he lets it die, God helps him to forget it, and then there is fruit to follow. It's just as Jesus said in John chapter 12. And that's why it's huge for us to let go of any past, let the past die, so that we can see life in that current relationships. But oftentimes, we would rather take a conflict to the grave instead of taking it to the cross. We would rather die with that conflict than just let that conflict die. The invitation that God has for us is to take it to the cross. Don't hold on. Remember remember how the disciples thought, we got to hold on to our lives here, man. We got to just, we got to make sure that that we fight, you know, that we stand our ground. And Jesus says, no, 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 we, we win by going to the cross, by letting those things die, letting those things go, and then letting them die. And then that way, there will be new life all around us. That is how there is life beyond itself, is to let that thing die so that new life can be produced. Danielle Strickland was a speaker from the Exponential Com- uh, Conference our leadership team went to this past week, which was great, by the way. It was just great to spend some time as a team. You know, anytime you're in proximity, you just kind of feel like things are moving forward together. So it was a really good time. But Danielle was one of the speakers at the conference. And she was talking about how she had gone to a foreign country. I can't remember which country it was. I, I wish I would have paid enough attention to remember all the details, but I'll get the gist right, I think. She's going to a foreign country. And her intent of going to that country is there had just been a bad massacre there. And she's there to mourn with those who are mourning. Danielle has been in ministry over 20 years. She's been a ministry leader for over 20 years. And she just made it a habit to go and mourn with those who are in pain. Well, she meets this lady. And this lady's husband and kids, I think she had four kids, were all killed in this massacre. And so she's over here just mourning, you know, trying to mourn with all these people and stuff like that. And this lady's sharing the story and everything. And Danielle says, oh, my goodness, as she shares this story. But I'll never forget this lady's response. She said, 
oh, you know what I do now? I go into the jail, and I actually meet consistently with the guy who killed my family. I actually have shared the gospel with him multiple times. And Danielle goes, what? I mean, literally steps back. What? What are you talking about? How could you do that? And this lady just responds. She goes, oh, do you not know Jesus? Wow. That's the power of the gospel right there. Jesus is so powerful that Stephen, who was stoned to death, hopes that those people who stoned him to death will join him in glory one day. That's how the gospel works. Hosea goes to the slums to buy back his prostitute wife because that's how the gospel works. Jesus goes to the cross on behalf of the people who put him there because that's how the gospel works. And I don't know how you come in, but you can let go and you can let die. That thing that happened with your parents decades ago, that thing that happened with that teacher, that that friend, that ex-church member, you can let those things go and let those things die at the cross and new life will be found. And maybe you come in and you just say, gosh, I just don't know if I can do that. Perhaps in those moments, you can simply ask yourself, oh, do you not know Jesus? Do you not know the the power of Jesus? The power of Jesus? Man, I don't know how you come in this morning, but we, we listen to that song and praise to that song of just be. Nothing else matters but being in his presence. Nothing else matters because he can take your situation. He can bring life. If we'll just say, yeah, I'm going to let it go and I'm going to let it die here in your presence so that you can bring about new life. What are you holding on to this morning? That God wants you to drop at his feet, cover it up, and walk away. Let's pray together. Father. Oh, we just pray, we just pray that you would work in this space. Maybe there are things we've held on to for a long, long time. And right now in this moment, we just say it's yours. We take it to the cross. We hold on to it no longer. Father, that's our prayer. Work in this space. We love you very, very much. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought about ending the service in some cool way to induce a response, but listen, if God is tugging on your heart at your seat, let something die, come to the altar, pray with somebody, whatever. But if he's nudging on your heart, man, respond. Just respond to his presence.